out of science, notably predict predictive ability, and other useful practical results out of religion, notably an antidote to depression. So there's no reason not to have both. Conflict arises only if you ask a bad question, which of the two corresponds to the way the world really is. But the conclusions of the conclusions chapter of Varieties cannot be read as saying only that. Instead, it says, religion tells you more than science does about what the world really is. But since this more will never get in science's way, your scientific logic should not object to it. In what I've written about James in the past, I've emphasized the similarities between his and Nietzsche's debunking of the traditional idea that we have a duty to bring our views into something called correspondence with reality. I focused on the willingness of both philosophers to say that the utility of a belief is the only judge of its truth. If James had pursued this line of thought consistently, he would have said that Nietzsche's outlook, peevish though it might be, was the one that Nietzsche had found most useful. It was the one that gave him the courage and energy to write his books and, as Alexander Nahamas has put it, to live his life as literature. The delight that Nietzsche took in the thought of eternal recurrence and in getting rid of one god surrogate after another, James might have said, played the same role in Nietzsche's life that the sense of the presence of God played in the lives of saints and mystics, and the same role that the conviction that natural science is the be-all and end-all played in Clifford's life, and that the belief that natural science was not the whole story had played in James's father's life. Had James carried through on his pragmatism, he would have simply let religious, the term religious, be a synonym for vitally important to somebody's self-image, and let it go at that. He would not have tried to discriminate between total reactions upon life that are religious and those that are not, and he would have called Nietzsche's total reaction as religious as Arnold's or Emerson's. Had James consistently taken this route, he would not have raised the question of whether, I quote, the personal religion of which I propose to treat does or does not contain, quote, some elements which morality pure and simple does not. He would have carried through on the thought that, I quote again, religious awe is the same organic thrill which we feel in a forest at twilight. He would have said not only that, quote, the Stoic, Buddhist, and Christian saints share the same feelings and the same conduct, but that many defiantly atheistic moralists do as well. This would have led him eventually to say what Dewey did say in A Common Faith, I quote, those who hold to the notion that there is a definite kind of experience which is itself religious, by that very fact, make out of it something specific as a, kind of as, as a kind of experience that is marked off from experience as aesthetic, scientific, moral, or political, and from experience as companionship and friendship. But religious, Dewey continues, as a quality of experience signifies something that may belong to all these experiences. It is the polar opposite of some type of experience that can exist by itself. Dewey went on to conclude that all that a report of a religious experience can be said to prove is, quote, the existence of some complex of conditions that have operated to affect an adjustment in life, an orientation that brings with it a sense of security and peace, the sort of thing that Clifford, Henry James, Sr., Nietzsche all had. Reinforcing the point, Dewey said, quote, it is the claim of religions that they affect this generic and enduring change in attitude. I should like to turn the statement around and say that whenever this change takes place, there is a definitely religious attitude. This Deweyan line of thought would have been a natural one for the author of Philosophical Conceptions and Practical Results to have pursued, but it is not the most salient line of thought in varieties. It's one that comes to the surface of the text only by fits and starts. Consider, for example, James's italicized definition of religion in the second chapter of Varieties, quote, 
and the feelings, acts, and experiences of individual men in their solitude so far as they apprehend themselves to stand in relation to whatever they may consider the divine. That obviously can be taken in a very wide or any of a series of progressively narrower senses. James is sometimes inclined to anticipate Tillich by saying that anything counts as divine that is a symbol, that is somebody's symbol of ultimate concern. Such genial tolerance can, for example, be read into his assertion that, quote, the divine can mean no single quality, it must mean a group of qualities by being champions of which in alternation different men may all find worthy missions. But passages such as that one are contradicted by those in which he defines the religious life in such a way as to ensure that no committed naturalist can lead such a life. The pragmatic reduction of experiences to their effect on practice is prominent in the first chapter of Varieties, but by the time the last chapter is reached, it has been displaced. In the first chapter, Religion as Neurology, to which Jerry Brenner referred, James is concerned to brush aside the claim of what he calls medical, medical materialism that many religious experiences are symptoms of mental pathology. Quote, when we think certain states of mind superior to others, James asks, is it ever because of what we know concerning their organic antecedents? No. It is always for two entirely different reasons. It is either because we take an immediate delight in them or else it is because we believe them to bring us good consequential fruits for life." Unquote. Had he stuck to that line of thought, he would have said that it hardly matters whether the sense of a wider self from which saving experiences come is caused by a chance surplus of serotonin, or, as the last chapter of the book holds, by an immaterial entity that is itself the remote cause of the serotonin surplus. All that matters would be the consequential fruits of life of that sense. So the question of which total reactions to life are truly religious could be set aside. The purely pragmatic view, the one characteristic of the early chapters of varieties, would urge that only short-term or long-term happiness matters when judging the worth either of a short-term experience or of a long-term outlook. That methodological principle may seem to lie behind James's claim in the chapter on the sex soul that, quote, the purely naturalistic look at life, however enthusiastically, however enthusiastically it may be held, is sure to end in sadness, close quotes. But of course, that assertion amounts to the very dubious empirical claim that naturalists like Clifford are incapable of the lasting happiness achieved by, say, Wesley or Emerson. In such passages, James simply turns a blind eye to all the joyful naturalists, the people like Marx, Nietzsche, and Dewey, who are as eschatologically exuberant as any Christian, but whose descriptions of the universe are naturalistic through and through. To sum up, James is torn between a Deweyan redefinition of religious, a redefinition in which pragmatism, to which pragmatism would seem naturally to lead, and the desire to confine the term religions, religious to something that covers Arnold and Emerson, but not Nietzsche or Marx. He's also torn between saying that we should adopt Arnold's and Emerson's quasi-theism because naturalism leads to despair, and saying that we should do so on the basis of experience, by, uh, on the basis of empirical evidence. He dithers between saying that quasi-theism is good